Okay, good morning everybody. Let's continue with our efforts to answer the question, how long are our fossil fuels going to last? Considering we still rely on them for a significant fraction, perhaps half, of our current energy requirements. And in order to apply some equations to answer that equation, we need to be careful to understand three basic things. Cumulative reserve, production, and ultimate resource. And as we'll see, estimating things like ultimate resource can be uh, very problematic for various reasons. Now, if we use oil as our example here, historically oil companies have tended to mount a continuous global exploratory effort and they do that so they can maintain reserves of oil equivalent to between 10 and 20 years of current production and you'll see from the following graphs that production always tends to peak around about 10 to 20 years after initial discovery of the field depending upon the size of the field. In other words what we're saying is that the reserves increase as production grows now we have to measure the resource limit, and we'll define that in a moment. And we're going to base um, the following equations uh, on an analysis done by Campbell and Lahere, which was published in March 1998 of Scientific American. So we're just going to take out the components of that analysis uh, to highlight how to calculate lifetime of fossil fuels. So as we said, we need three numbers to project future oil production. We need to know how much oil has actually been extracted to date. That's obvious. We need an estimate of the reserves. In other words, that's the amount of oil that an oil company can pump out of the ground of existing oil fields. And we need to have some kind of estimate of the quantity of conventional oil remaining to be discovered and exploited. So that's going to be our resource. Now together, all those add up to a finite quantity of the resource, the ultimate resource, <coughs> or sometimes called little r lim. It, it varies depending upon which report you look at. We also need to look at cumulative production, because that can be estimated reasonably well. Why? Well, because oil companies monitor the flow very accurately of the oil coming out of their wells, for obvious reasons. Now that record, however, is still not perfect, because oil companies don't necessarily always tell you exactly what they're producing, but it's sufficiently good that you can make some reasonably good estimates of the cumulative production. So, what about the total current reserves? Well, that's where we run into some problems. It's much harder to estimate that. And those figures tend to come from unchecked data received by trade journals from oil companies and governments, as we mentioned. And those are problematic for reasons we mentioned last time. We tend to get a range of values produced by a geologist, a geologist who surveys a particular oil well. And as we said, companies are often vague about the confidence of the reserve estimates, so they might only publicise the one that best suits them to enhance their market value. And we highlighted this example of the OPEC countries, which, some of which were taken over by governments from private companies, and then all of a sudden the estimates increased by between 42 and 197 percent, suspiciously. So, let's move on. In the United States, for example, there is actually a strict legal definition about what you can call a reserve as being proved. It's only proved when the oil is very close to current oil producing wells, and there is what they say a reasonable certainty that the oil that's recoverable from that well it can be extracted using existing technology and at current prices. That's obviously to make sure that they don't bias at any market values. Now to estimate the unproved reserves, Campbell and Navarre used the medium estimate of provable reserves in each field. Remember the geology surveys would give a range of estimates. So what they did was they took the median value in other words, that's the number of barrels of oil that are likely as not to be able to be extracted out of a particular well. 
So according to their analysis of wells from across the globe, they estimated 850 gigabarrels of oil, conventional oil, was remaining. Now, theirs is not the only estimate. For example, various trade journals estimated it um, to be somewhat higher, around about 1,019 gigabarrels of oil. That's the sort of range of estimates we're looking at, 850 to 1,019 gigabarrels of oil. But let's stick with 850 gigabarrels of oil for now. That actually equates, using our mass energy equivalents, to around about 5 Q of energy left. However, we also need to know the size of the ultimate recovery, because obviously we can keep discovering new wells. Well, about 80% of oil flows from fields that we, uh, in, by the time of this uh, analysis in 1998, 80% of all the oil that was flowing out of fields actually were from fields that were discovered before 1973. And most of those were in decline. The reason it's 80% is because we discover the biggest oil fields first. And as you continue to explore, you tend to find, on average, smaller and smaller fields. So, Cameron and Herrera used the following approaches to estimate what we call the total recoverable resource. And they arrived at a figure of around about 1,000 gigabarrels of oil for the total recoverable resource. We'll put this into an equation later. So that gives a total remaining energy resource of 6Q approximately. So one of the things they did, for example, is they looked at all the various wells and they plotted the annual oil production, so the vertical axis here is millions of barrels, versus the oil produced to date, again in millions of barrels. And pretty much all wells, if you do this for any well, produce a curve that looks like that. Initially, of course, the annual production increases rapidly and then peaks, and then as the oil starts to decline, there is a, the reserve runs out, the curve tends to decrease like that. So what they did was they essentially looked for the peak and produced a regression through that curve and extrapolated to this x-axis to find out the total oil that could be produced from that particular well. This particular curve is for the thistle oil field actually off the coast of the United Kingdom. So they estimated, for example, that this oil well would produce in total 420 million pounds of oil. So you can apply that to pretty much all oil wells that are in production. Then they also looked at the cumulative discovered oil. Again, this one is in gigabarrels of oil on the vertical axis, uh, versus the cumulative number of exploratory wells. And they did this for a large number of different regions. And this graph just shows that uh, comparison for the region of the former Soviet Union and Africa. And what you can see from these curves is that they tend to increase sharply because you discover the biggest fields first and production obviously gets larger and larger. And then you essentially discover smaller and smaller fields and this curve flattens off towards some kind of theoretical maxima. Now if you look at the curve for Africa, for example, the theoretical maximum approaches eventually around about 120 gigabarrels of oil. But of course, practical limits, costs, time constraints would tend to limit that to a practical level of around about 100 gigabarrels of oil. So you can do that, again, for lots of different regions. You can also look at the distribution of oil sizes. So you can look at the oil initially in a, in, in a particular field, millions of barrels, and rank them in terms of the size of the largest field. In this case, they put the largest first, and you can plot that as a function of time. This happens to be for field sizes in the Gulf of Mexico. Note that's a logarithmic scale. So these parabolas can be drawn as a function of time, and you can see that they simply expand out here with this envelope over all of them that can be projected to look at the uh, ultimate distribution of all uh, fields that we're going to get out of that region. You can also check estimates of production versus the rise and fall of discovery of this particular region. And this graph, for example, is for the world outside the Persian Gulf. So here we have the oil found, discovered, or the top, the oil produced, or oil fields outside the Middle East. And again, you can see rising, rising to a peak and then declining. 
obviously, as you discover new fields, this is going to fluctuate a lot. But on average, you will see it reaches a peak and then starts to decline. So, let's write down some equations, and we're going to use the terms cumulative reserve, and we're going to give it the symbol little r. And the reserve of a commodity is defined as, so it could be oil or gas, it's the amount of that commodity known to exist in specified places in the ground which can be extracted at a specific cost. Now, that cumulative reserve can obviously be reduced by extraction and use, so it's going to change with time, but we want to try and look for the rate of change of R with time. But of course it can also be increased by extra ex exploration, studying new fields, or we might want to incorporate higher cost deposits. For example, we might have some advances in extraction technology which makes it economical to extract those reserves which previously we wouldn't bother looking at because it's expensive. So, it's mainly a function of time. So, a little r, cumulative reserves, is a function of t, time. Then we need to look at the resource, which we give the symbol big R. Try not to get confused between cumulative reserve little r and resource big R. Remember, the resource is the total extractable material that's going to be deposited beneath the Earth's surface. Now, the size of that deposit is going to depend on how much you're going to pay or want to pay. So it's going to be a function of cost. So big R is a function of cost. Now, as we said initially, the cumulative reserve is going to change with time, as we saw in those previous graphs. And the initial stages of growth of, for example, the cumulative reserve of this commodity, in this case oil, we can describe by a simple differential equation. In this case, it's referred to as a Malthus's equation. But that assumes there's no limit on the amount of reserve. Remember, the reserve held is entirely dictated by the demand up to the present, present time. The rate of growth, the R to T, is proportional to the magnitude of the cumulative reserve. So the R to T is proportional to R, little r. But of course, as we saw later in the supply of the fuel, it's very apparent that the resource has got a limit, which we call the ultimate resource of the fuel, big R. So the rate of change is going to start to slow down. So, the rate of change of the cumulative reserve is going to be proportional to the remaining undiscovered reserve. So, the less available the resource, the lower the rate of change, so that curve slows down and approaches a limit. So, the rate of change of cumulative reserve is essentially what we have to be also proportional to in our equation, so big R minus little r. In other words, the rate of change of the cumulative is dr t equals uh, cr times big R minus little r. So, let's now start to solve this equation. Divide by big R squared, get that, and we'll go through this in your own time. Let's just set F equal to the ratio of little r to big R. And then dF dt, remember at the end of the day we want an equation that essentially tells us how this ratio is going to change as a function of time. So we're looking for an equation that has this in it, and on the other side, we want something with t to some time in the future, some start time to some time in the future, so a time interval. So dF dt is what we're looking for. We get CRF or minus F. Let's rearrange that. And remember, we want to integrate over time from some start time t0, where we've got all these estimates, some time in the future, where we're going to say, well, how long is it going to take to, for example, use up 90% of our fossil fuel, or 80%. Let's use that separation, dF over f1 minus f equals dF over f plus dF over 1 minus f. Integrate again, which is what we're looking for. And we get that simple equation there, the log of f over t, uh, f of t divided by f of t naught, t naught being the start time, minus log of 1 minus f of t over 1 minus f of t naught. And we have that term on the right hand side, which has the time interval we're interested in, t minus t naught. Let's rearrange that, take um, exponentials. So again, we have on the right-hand side note an exponential involving t minus t naught. Rearranging, 
rearranging, we end up with that final equation for f of t. And let's resubstitute in for f. And we get finally this equation, which is what we're looking for, r of t divided by big R is equal to this expression here. And notice from the bottom, the bottom we've got this exponential term, which is proportional to minus cr times t minus t naught. This is referred to as the Verholz equation. So it's important that you know how to derive this equation and understand what these different terms are, because you can apply this equation to a lot of different fossil fuel resources to estimate the lifetime of that fossil fuel. So if you were to plot the curves there, you can either plot them as the cumulative production or, or the production and compare that with the reserve, the cumulative reserve. So in red is the reserve. Again, you can see it reaches a peak and it starts to decline. If you look at the cumulative for the reserve, uh, which, is also, which is in green, you can see it approaches that theoretical maximum. So that effectively tells you what the lifetime of your fossil fuel is, provided you know what little r and big R is. So, Campbell and the Herrera took this information, they used the Verhoeven equation, and they came up with a number of, uh, of uh, conclusions based on all the data they had. And this is just a list of some of the things that they predicted based on their analysis. Remember, this was just before the year 2000. They said, for example, for the UK, North Sea oil fields would peak in production by the turn of the century, which they did. By 2002, the world would rely on Middle East nations for most of their oil, which they did, around about two thirds. Once about 900 gigabarrels of oil, uh, of oil, 850 actually, that's about five fuels consumed, then production would start to decline, which it did. And it seems likely that production of conventional oil, remember we're talking globally here, this will change depending upon the region and the country, but on average the production will start to fall. And they said it would also seem likely that production of conventional oil would peak around 2010 globally. Remember this is conventional oil. Now remember, they weren't the only ones to make these kinds of estimates, because obviously it's quite important to know how long your fossil fuel is going to last. And the United States Geological Survey had actually also produced an estimate using some older figures from 1991. And they estimated that there was actually a recoverable amount of remaining oil of 1,550 gigabarrels of oil, so just over 50% more than Campbell and the Herrera estimated. But again, they estimated the peak <coughs> was within 15 years, in other, in other words, 2015 instead of 2010, so not that far out. There was yet another estimate made prior to that, which showed that there was actually, well, they estimated there was about twice as much oil remaining, although they conceded that their estimate was rather optimistic. So effectively what we're saying is that all these estimates are essentially the same as those made in 1971, when the original uh, date was available. They thought between 8 and 12 Q remained. By 1990, 7Q was left with 3Q being used from 1971 to 1990. And by 2000, 5Q and 6Q left. That's 5Q used and 6Q left. What we're saying is that these estimates are a good indication that the numbers are about right. So the problem really reduces to uh, what this one. Can we actually smooth out that peak in order to ease our way into a situation free from reliance on oil as painlessly as possible. In other words, can these renewable energy sources be brought up to sufficiently high level in order to smooth out that peak and remove our dependence on oil in the future? Now, what about the uncertainties in these estimates? Well, for example, we might find huge undetected deposits. Well, that's unlikely because oil companies actually undertake massive explorations of, across the globe. Only the polar regions, interestingly, and the deep ocean typically remain. And it's mainly been shown that most of the deep ocean is barren as far as conventional oil is concerned. There might be new technology, as we mentioned. 
that might increase a fraction of oil we can extract from each field. There may be an advanced recovery methods that might actually increase the life of a particular oil field. But that's really only going to delay the, initial, the, the, the ultimate decline of the field. But also, we need to remember that it can be misleading because oil companies often build technological developments into their estimates. And for example, most of the oil, say roughly two thirds, which comes out of Middle Eastern countries, they actually have what's called primary recovery oil. It flows out of the oil through the oil bores very, very easily because it's got very low viscosity. So you're not really going to expand the efficiency by which you can get the oil out of the ground by very much. However, people have looked at ways of improving the recovery from oil fields. For example, there's what's called secondary recovery. What's that? Well, they pump pressurized water into the oil reservoir, and that will then expoil, uh, expel the oil. That, of course, would increase the initial estimate. Then there's also what's called tertiary recovery. So, for example, some oil fields, the oil is actually quite viscous. So you could add polymers to water, which you can pump in, and that would change the flow patterns, increasing the rate of expulsion of the oil from the field. Some people have even set fire to the oil in situ to raise the pressure of the oil field and even then um, increase the flow and uh, out by reducing the viscosity. If you look at all these, as we said, they are only going to slow things down a little bit. They might add a further 2Q to our total estimate. Then we have unconventional oil. And that's where there is a lot of uncertainty. By unconventional oil, we're talking about tar sands and shale deposits. Now, estimates of these vary enormously. It's thought there might be huge reserves in Canada, Venezuela, suffering some uh, energy problems at the moment, the former Soviet Union, and indeed the northwest of Colorado. But remember, when we're talking about tar sands and shale deposits, these have to be mined like coal. You then have to heat treat the material. So you're not drilling for oil and allowing it to be pumped out. So of course, with mining, heat treating, etc., you're going to have very large environmental problems and costs. And that's going to obviously increase air and water pollution, heavy metal contamination, and then what do you do with all the waste? Now, Cameron and Herrera estimate skeptically that only 700 gigabarrels are going to be recoverable, I4Q, from all of these additional approaches. But there is a large uncertainty with that number. So this is the equation which you should remember. Make sure you can derive it, because there are some problems associated with that equation on the Blackboard um, page. So we'll go through the, some of those when we return after the holidays. So, where does this all leave us with regards to oil resources? Well, the Energy Information Administration forecasted oil demand is going to rise by about 60% before 2020. They also suggested that political tensions could mean a, a larger a, a return to the large market share of Middle East OPEC states. The largest fields are also going to peak last in terms of flow, and that might curb demand on its own. However, even by 2010, this was after the Campbell and the Herrera report, even the Middle East uh, oil production was past its midpoint. And Campbell and the Herrera warned that planning strategies, remember this was 1998, for an oil-free economy must begin now. And they summed up their analysis by stating that what our society does face, however, is the end of abundant and cheap oil on which all industrial nations depend. So, our best estimate <coughs> of the total oil remaining, uh, remaining oil resource, let's call that R1, is 6Q. Given enhanced technology, new finds, etc., the best guess for our ultimate practical resource, for that R2, is 12Q, say. And then come on her estimate that for sand and oil shale, it's a bit pessimistic, so let's 
assume an ultimate practical resource estimate R2 to be 15 Q. So we're looking at 12 to 15 Q as our ultimate practical resource. Now, the absolute ultimate resource value, sometimes called R infinity, could therefore range from 14 Q with some wildly optimistic values even going up to 30 Q. So those are the sorts of range of figures, but 15 Q is probably a good estimate. This isn't in your slides, I'll add this later, but if you actually look at the um, various reports from oil companies, this is what they tend to say. This was from about 20, a report in 2015 by British Petroleum. First of all, they summed up by saying 80% of oil was being provided by OPEC countries, about two thirds from Middle Eastern countries. The world in 2015 14 used about 34 billion barrels of crude raw oil every year, but again, that estimate is unreliable. And in a previous report, they also estimated that the global oil reserve was 1.688 trillion barrels of oil. Interestingly, in their 2015 report, they also noticed that oil production in China had already peaked in 2015, so again, that's, in, that's very consistent with the Campbell and the Herrera report. So, based on all the, this data and applying Campbell and Herrera's analysis, it means that oil will run out, based on that 2015 report, in 2067. However, remember that's based on proved reserves how much oil they think they can drill out of the ground while making a profit, obviously. So the current end date for oil was estimated to be 2067 or thereabouts. But that doesn't include non-conventional oil. Uh, but remember, oil field discovery is slowing down as predicted. What about gas? Well, as we saw from our previous um, lecture, gas seems to be increasing to replace oil. Now, the estimated gas resources globally is actually quite similar to that of oil. But until the last five years, it was actually less well exploited. The use of gas as a fuel has some environmental advantages over fossil fuels. What are they? Well, for example, it emits less CO2 for the same amount of energy out. 40% less, uh, less than coal. 25% less than uh, oil. Gas-powered electric power stations are actually also much cheaper to run. For example, if we go back to the 1990s, the cost of a gas-fired uh, power station was 2.2 pence per kilowatt hour. And this nuclear power station then was around about 5 pence per kilowatt hour. Coal stations were somewhere in between the two. Obviously those costs have changed a little bit since then. Now, back in the 1990s, the US Geological Survey uh, gave estimates for oil and gas in units of Q available. So they looked at the cumulative production, the identified or discovered reserves, the undiscovered conventional resources, future resources, and then total resources. So these values are in Qs, these are in barrels of oil in the brackets. But what you can see is that the total resources are not that different. They're very similar. Now, the future given for oil by the USGS was, is higher, remember, than our initial estimate, by about 50%. But that doesn't make that much difference to the overall argument about when it's going to run out within 10 to 15 years. So we can take, say, 10Q as our R1 estimate for gas as well. R1, remember, is the estimate assuming conventional technology and costs. Our R2 estimate for oil, we said was 15 Q. Given the USBS estimate for gas, a similar search for oil, we might postulate a very similar value for R2 of 15 Q. But we said that gas is now being very well developed. Existing gas fields tend to be close to areas of consumption, mainly because of difficulties with transportation, but that's changing. Bearing that in mind, we could opt for a larger estimate for R2 of, say, 20Q. Remember, these are just estimates. There are also other, I guess you could call them non-conventional deposits of methane, for example, so-called solid hydrated methane, or methane clathrates. And those are often found by oil drillers at medium depths, particularly under the Arctic permafrost, but also under the ocean. 
Now, an estimate of those high grades are highly uncertain. Some have been in very, very large indeed, particularly for the Arctic region. The question is, do we have the technology to recover those methane clathrate resources? One of the problems, of course, is if you actually to sort of take some methane clathrates in the lab, there's some there in somebody's hand, it will spontaneously combust as you raise it up to um, atmospheric pressure, etc. But there have been experimental um, rigs uh, developed. This one is actually in the Sea of Japan, where they can extract methane clathrates from sub subocean sources. So it is possible, but as yet it's not really been expanded to become anything significant. So as a result, it's quite difficult to be certain about R2, and much harder to put a, put a figure on the ultimate resource R infinity. But let's assume a nice optimistic value of, say, 600 Q for gas and oil total now. So what about coal? Well, that, the estimates are actually a bit better there. Based on analysis of known abundances, we've got about 280 Q for the global reserve. But of course, again, there's efficiency issues with extracting it, difficulty of extracting very um, deep uh, coal, etc. So let's say 140 Q, allowing for a 50% extraction efficiency. And that actually compares quite well with the previous uh, estimate, in, again in Scientific America in 1990, where they estimated 150 Q. Now, given our other estimates are much larger, um, but also, remember, these are not the only estimates. There's a chap called Dorf who estimated a value of 400 Q for coal. Let's be generous and give R2 for coal of 500 Q. So we're being really generous there. And what we're going to see next is a world production projection for coal given two different estimates of the total resource. One is for 190Q and one for 170Q. And you can see it doesn't actually make much difference in terms of the peak. Effectively what we're saying is that we have enough coal based on those estimates that should last us into the 24th century at current production and consumption rates. So it's clear there's abundant supply of coal until at least well into the 24th century, certainly the 23rd century. But there are several drawbacks, as you know, to coal. Despite what Mr. Trump says, coal is a dirty fuel. It produces far more CO2 than any of the other sources for fuel or energy release. So it contributes to anthropogenic climate warming. It also has a high sulfur content, which you have to remove using fuel gas desulfurization uh, rigs. Those have to be fitted to coal power fired power stations in most industrial countries where regulation requires them to reduce SO2 emission levels and deposition of sulfuric acid, for example. And those rigs are very expensive to implement and maintain. And of course, burning coal produces fly ash. That's normally removed electrostatically in the plume as it's burning. However, even a one gigawatt power plant will require at the end of one year of operation two and a half hectares of land for disposal of all that uh, ash to a height of seven and a half meters. Obviously there are environmental impacts associated with that, but also we have environmental impacts associated with mining of coal. Groundwater will become contaminated by acidification. And of course, we've got all these refuse, spoil banks, subsurface, subsidence, erosion, and strip pits that we also have to think about and their impact on the environment. And if you're interested, listen to the song Mountain Top Removal, I think it's called. Okay. So, the final word, uh, or at least in 2018, from um, various organisations. For oil, globally the current oil consumption is about 11 billion tonnes of oil from fossil fuels every year. Crude oil reserves are reducing at about 4 billion tonnes a year. And at current rates, oil deposits could run out in just over 50, 53 years. Gas, if we were to increase gas production to fill the hole, as we currently are doing, left by oil, known gas reserves will also run out in about the same time, because we estimated the same 
uh, value for R2, etc. Coal. Well, if we do run out of oil and gas and have to replace those with coal, then known coal deposits would, start to, would last 150 years, not into the 24th century. And there are various estimates based on how long uh, those resources would last if we start to replace oil and gas uh, to uh, match current consumption, etc. So you can see certainly by the end of the century we'd start to use up a significant amount of gas and coal. So, what are we going to do to fill the gap? Bearing in mind we don't want to use coal, or as little as possible, to minimise the impact on climate. Well, we have to look at other non-renewable resources, and of course that means nuclear fission resources. So remember, uranium oxide, concentrate from oil production, supplies about 90% of the requirements of our power utilities, potentially. Its use has expanded since 2005, it slowed down a little bit after 2010. But since 2005 we've been producing about 78 to 80,000 tonnes of uranium oxide to over 400 reactors worldwide, <coughs> giving us around about 370 gigawatts of electricity. Now, if we look at the costs associated with fission fuel, well, back in 2004, it would cost you $15 per pound, sorry, American units, of uranium ore, U308. But in 2014, that had risen significantly to $40 per pound, so cost is an issue. The other problem is that accurate estimates of uranium fuel reserves are difficult to come by and believe. Several countries, for various reasons, are not even willing to publicise their own reserves. The energy delivery per unit mass of fuel is also dependent on how you burn that fuel, the type of reactor you use. For example, we mentioned this before, a fast breed reactor, where we have the main isotope U238 converted to plutonium 239 increases the energy yield over a conventional thermal reactor by a factor as much as 60, which is why fast breed reactors are actually preferred. Now the current resource R1 for nuclear fuel is around about 4 Q, but obviously if we were to use that in a fast breeder reactor it would be up to about 250 Q. That's a big increase. Now the consensus is that the ultimate practical resource, R2, is actually going to be much larger, typically 100 Q for thermal, 6,000 Q for a fast breeder reactor. So obviously we could look to that to help fill the gap while we sort out the renewable uh, fuel components of our energy budget. Now, the problem is that the amount of uranium in the accessible part of the Earth's crust is equivalent to about 108 Q. That's accessible. However, a lot of that's not realistically usable because the fuel is extremely dilute, so dilute that the energy you use in actually extracting and concentrating it will be greater than the amount of energy you can get out of it. The other drawback, of course, is that there is a potential major health and environmental problem. That's a perception. Um, there are lots of political arguments for and against. If you're interested in arguments for, there is a separate short presentation on Blackboard called Khan Craft, which you might want to look at, which actually compares nuclear fuel to oil and gas and explains why it's a lot better. So Khan Craft. Why, why Sweden went for Karnkraft, Karnkraft is the Swedish word for nuclear fuel. So have a look at that if you're interested. But the perception is still because of issues like uh, incidents like Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, Fukushima, the nuclear industry does not have a good reputation. However, having said that, remember countries such as France and Belgium and Sweden produce very large fractions of their electricity from nuclear power stations, and they've had very little in the way of incidents. So this is just uh, some data back from 2014 and 2016, which shows the electricity uh, generation from nuclear fuel. These numbers are in billion kilowatt hours, but the number to look at is this column here, which is the percentage of electricity produced by nuclear power. So you can see Belgium, 
47.5%. France, 76.9%. It's actually now over 80%. Sweden, 41.5%. Uh, I was looking for Finland. Yes, Finland, 34.6%. Sweden actually builds the nuclear reactors for Finland. And they've had no problems. And Sweden, Finland, etc., the rest of their energy comes from renewables like wind and solar. Mainly wind and hydro, actually, sorry. Germany, a little bit less, similar to the UK. So you can do it with nuclear. The question is, is it politically acceptable? So how else might we look to fill the energy gap? We'll actually say what the energy gap is. Uh, in tomorrow's lecture. Well, fusion, of course. Everybody's heard about fusion. The problem is feasibility. They've been promising fusion since I was at school. So for over 50 years, they said it's going to be the answer to all our energy problems, but so far, nobody's actually produced a reactor that can produce anything near sufficient energy to be of practical use. Now, if we were to look at deuterium as the main fuel, in a fusion reactor. Well, in naturally occurring water, of course, there's a lot. In fact, it's estimated there's around about 1,010 Q just by extracting deuterium from water, because that's a very easy and low cost uh, process. However, it's looking like modern uh, future fusion reactors, if they ever get built, is going to be restricted to a mixture of deuterium and tritium. So the limiting resource in those reactors is going to be lithium, from which you get tritium, via this equation here. Now the first deuterium tritium ignition process has already been demonstrated. So the known reserves of tritium have been evaluated as equivalent to an energy production of around 200 Q. So that could be useful. But it's a vague estimate. And certainly a minimum, because exploration for lithium until recently has not been an issue until, of course, the boom of rechargeable batteries. So, for example, we now have estimates of the world lithium resources and reserves and tons, but remember, lithium is used for lots of other things. Ceramics, glass, batteries make up about two-thirds of the lithium use and production. But we don't really have very accurate, reliable measurements of what, how much lithium there is down there. We know it's one of the most abundant uh, elements there, but in terms of actually getting to those, those reserves, the estimates are very poor. And indeed, in just one year from 2000 and 2010, the world <coughs> estimate of lithium resources increased from 13.8 to 25.5 megatons. So things are changing very rapidly as new sources are discovered. So most reserve projections are probably underestimated. The best estimate is around about 13 million tons, for example in 2011. So we have to think about the reserves of these other elements that might be useful in production, uh, in reactors such as fusion reactors to generate electricity. So there's a lot of work currently going on in fusion. Um, a few years ago, for example, in 2013, production was started. Initially, it was supposed to finish in 2019 of the ITER, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is a collaboration between multiple international partners to produce the world's first practical fusion reactor. This is a tokamak reactor. And it was expected to generate about 500 megawatt of power, but only for 20 minutes, using 50 megawatt of input power. It's been running, it's run into delays, budget overruns, and hasn't yet worked. So a number of those collaborators have started to build their own. For example, Demo, Wendelstein 7X, NIF, Hyper, MAST, as well as CEFETA, the Anime China Fusion Engineering Test Reactor, and also the MIT SPA. So there's the um, CEFETA reactor, which is currently near completion in China, and that's the MIT SPA reactor, which is currently uh, starting construction. However, those are not really going to start producing even small amounts of electricity until about 2030, 2040. 
So, let's summarise those resources in the last five minutes. So we're going to summarise all those different resources, fossil fuels, oil, gas, coal, fission, and let's split fission and fuel into thermal and breeder reactor uh, uh, energy outputs, and fusion. So remember, R1 is the estimate of the resource at present cost and current known technology. R2 is our best guess at the ultimate resource with reasonably extrapolated technology. And R infinity is going to be our so-called natural limit. So you can see for R1, for oil, gas, and coal, we're looking at 6, 10, and maybe 33 Q for coal. R2 ranges from 15, 20, and 500 Q. Some uncertainties for oil and gas, but probably those are fairly accurate. Our infinity, for all of them together, we're looking at around about 600 Q for oil and gas, maybe 107 Q for coal. Fission, well, we start to run into some issues in regards to uh, political acceptance, but 4 Q for thermal, 250 Q, remember, for fusion, 100 Q for R2, 6,000 Q for fast breeder reactors. And we're looking at an R infinity of around about 108 Q in terms of the fuel available. Fusion, very uncertain. Um, if we assume that deuterium tritium uh, reactors uh, will work, we'll have done maybe 200 Q and maybe greater than 200 Q for R2. Nobody really knows or has done a good estimate for R infinity. So those are the sorts of Q values we're looking at for all these non renewable fuels. So, in brief, we said at the end of the period of world population growth and stabilization, we're looking at probably about 5 Q per year for people's use. We said it would take us to the year 2080 or so to reach stability in that population energy uh, number. Oil and gas resources are finite, they're small, they're already declining. Those items are likely to be exhausted before the steady state is reached. 2060 to 2070 at best. Coal resources are more plentiful, but we said its use should be restricted because of climate change and fears of increasing CO2 source strength. It's been estimated that if you want to keep climate warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade globally, we should probably keep about 80% of current fossil fuels in the ground. So that's one of the limitations being discussed. Nuclear power is comparatively large. Resources are likely to last through that planning stage, that period of change, so it will be looked at and it will be part of the energy mix. However, except for solar power, all the alternative sources we looked at individually are small. The sum total is, in the case of the UK, significant, or Denmark significant, or Sweden, for example, hydropower is significant, but globally it's not going to be sufficient. So, we'll finish tomorrow by looking at the implications, and I'll also give you some hints for exam revision. So tomorrow will be the last lecture. When we come back from holidays, there will be two extra lectures slotted in the timetable, and we'll go through some past exam questions. Uh, all the information is also on Blackboard. So if you can't make the, those lectures when we come back from holidays, um, all the material will be on Blackboard. Okay, any questions? Thanks for coming.
，他们不会，我哪会解剖机？妈的，我解剖机，解剖机。啊，你们也不会说话，女生不会学，掉掉掉裤子，操！操！不要了，从不简单的那个，哦，正经吗？快救！